bit. So for last season, you look at clubs like Liverpool where they've invested heavily in English players, yeah. which some may argue they've paid above the odds for. Um, but then again, when you look at foreign players, it's always the risk that they don't always settle immediately at yeah. the football club. When you was at Hull and Bolton, how did you approach the transfer market? Well, we had to, as a matter of course, um, from a financial perspective, we had to invest in the foreign market. And, and more often than not, it was it was in the loan transfer market, not the full transfer market, because you know our budget at the time. I think if we're going back to 1999, 2000, our budget was in the region of 10, 11, 12 million. You know. Compared to nowadays, I mean, you're talking 35 million for Andy Carroll, one hit. Um, so, the foreign foreign transfer market and the foreign loan transfer market was more attractive to us um, because of the financial constraints, and and consequently that in itself brought its own problems. You know, um, you're bringing players in, you're talking about settling at a football club and, and getting your football on the pitch to do the talking. Um, it was very very difficult for players who came. And weren't really part of the of the bigger picture, the family, as it were, because it was by definition it was it was transient, you know, it was a, an in and out transfer move. Uh, but consequently, you know, one or two of them transfer loans actually worked full time permanently because they settled in the area. I'm talking about the likes of JJ Kocha and Stelios Janakopoulos, Bruno and Gotti, people like that. You know, we actually signed them on a permanent basis after a, a successful loan period. Do you feel there's as much risk in signing an English or a UK-based player as there is a foreign player? Do I think there's much as, as much risk, risk in this sense that? Yeah. Um, should people just assume that because they're from the UK, yeah. they're going to settle I think all, regardless? I think all transfers have, have an element of risk um, based on, obviously, background, based on, um, you know, may, maybe these players hadn't moved before, you know, maybe you get a 21, 22-year-old boy who, who'd lived at home for the first 21, 22 years of his life and then all of a sudden he gets this this wonderful deal into the Premier League and, and moves to a different area and then he's got the family to think about and he's not no girlfriend, no wife, uh, you've got to think about parents then and uh, yes it can be as, uh, as big a risk as, as what a foreign loan can be or, or transfer can be but at the same time as I say the, there is an element of risk in any transfer. How did you make those plans for welcome at the football club and, and actually settle in? Um, off the pitch as well. We had a, we had a, um, what, what can only be described as a family uh, football club, a family atmosphere. It was a family orientated environment and um, born out of the fact that the manager believed in that. I think, I think Sam Allardyce, by his own experiences, moved from Birmingham, Dudley, uh, when he was a young boy and uh, he settled in the area. I'm, I'm talking about 25, 30 years ago, you know, and he's always lived in Bolton since then. So. That was a marriage made in heaven, and Sam always believed in that family environment. Uh, I think he had a young family early on in his his football career. You know, he had uh, Craig, his son, uh, at, a, at an early age, and then uh, you know, if you if you talk about Sam's family, bigger family, he, he actually uses the football club as that family, or, or he used to, shall I say? Um, and I think that is important. You know, player liaison officers are important, coaches with an understanding of. of what it takes to sell in an area, you know, maybe you've got experience of that in your own playing career. Um, but you have to delve and investigate without prying, you know, without being too nosy. You have to find out whether these guys are settling. And uh, I've stumbled upon a, a number of unsettled players and they find out the reason. The reason can be minim minimal with regards to your own life, but, you know, just maybe the fact that uh, they don't know how to get a, a TV. Uh, or they don't know how to open a bank account, or, or something as trivial as that to you is very important to them in terms of you're only at the football club two or three hours a day and then you're going home to an empty house and maybe no family and, and that emptiness is the part that unsettles them and, the, and that's the part that doesn't allow them to, to play the football that you know they can play. Did you ever put on activities or events for the players to do outside of football to actually keep them busy, occupied and focused off the pitch as well? I think, not so much activities, I think it's the main thing is that you you have to you have to find that um, that family environment, you know, you have to make sure that, uh, you know, your player liaison officer is one of the most important uh, people in the football club, because if they can actually, and say we'll focus on JJ Okocha, when JJ first came here, he, he, the first six weeks he was nowhere near the player that we knew he was at, at PSG, and, uh, um, he had been to, to Turkey and he had been to, you know, he'd been to 
four or five different countries and we knew we could sell because he'd, he'd, he'd had that experience but um, when we investigated further five or six weeks down the line of JJ's tenure at the football club um, we found out that the house was empty that the family hadn't moved across um, he's, you know he's a big strong family man his children hadn't hadn't arrived and consequently he just wasn't playing the football that we knew we could play. So we had to get that. That was the, that was the big issue. Not not activities. That was the big issue. Once that was settled, he could then come into the football club more of a man. And you don't have to to occupy them. Once they've got their family there, that's a done deal as far as I'm concerned. That that's them in a nutshell. That's them more relaxed and playing the kind of football we knew they could play. Realistic though, can one player, the as an officer, or, or or maybe two or three at a football club, actually manage? All, all the cultures, all the different nationalities from the, the first team all the way down to the academy? No, I think that's difficult. Um, you do need help. You know, you need help from a religious point of view. You need help from a you know, schooling point of view, uh, from a back, background point of view, you know. I went across, uh, when I went across to, to Hull City, um, we um, employed a number of um, French, black Africans, and uh, from Congo and New Guinea and, and, and smaller countries, you know, and, and they, they weren't um, high profile players, you know. Kamal Zayeti uh, springs to mind, Kamal Gilas springs to mind, you know. The, these players arrived in Hull, and Hull, by definition, in, in England was a parochial club, so it didn't have this, um, you know, this metropolis or they didn't have this city centre mentality where you could protect each other, you know. So he was living in the sticks, and consequently, he didn't settle neither, you know. And it's, it's really, it's all about investigation, it's all about asking questions, it's all about not prying, but looking interested and making them feel that you are trying to understand so you can help them. Who would you actually say it's down to to actually find the accommodation for a player? Would you say it's an agent coming over? Is it down to the club as it's their player? Um, or even is it, is it down to maybe the own player's representatives yeah. to actually sort him out uh, I think it's for a the accommodation? Two stools, Jack, to tell you the truth. You know, the agent comes in and invariably if that agent um, there's a number of agents, there's a number of types of agents as well, and if that agent uh, is just in the game to make money, say for instance, he sees that um, that player as a, a, a license or a reason for him to make money, then once he's made the money, he moves on. But there's a lot of agents that are good agents that stay with the player, and if they stay with the player, then it's their responsibility, it's their shared responsibility that make sure that that player settles. But as I say shared, you can't say 50-50 because, you know, it depends on the, the relationship that the player has with the agent. But when he comes into your football club, it's your responsibility. And if the player, if the agent has moved on, uh, or, or if the agent has got a number of other players that he deals with, then this might be a small percentage of his business, one player for instance, he then becomes a bigger percentage of your, your business. And, um, and therefore, you know, you, have, you both have a responsibility is probably the answer. But to what percentage each, I don't, I don't think there's a, a definitive figure. Um, I think it's just a, a responsibility. If you see that that player is not playing the type of football that you've actually scouted him for, there's got to be a reason for it. Do you feel clubs spend enough time with the player himself? Maybe um, not. Maybe not. I don't think um, that maybe enough finances are put into that area. Um, and, and it's crazy when you think about it that you know you've got a, a player, a commodity uh, that becomes less of a commodity because he hasn't settled, which is crazy. Um, so it's so important, it's vitally important that um, you do uh, identify it first and foremost, but you know apportion some kind of finances towards it, towards helping that player sell. Surely you must feel vulnerable as a manager, as more times than not, it's the manager's head who rolls eventually, whether if the player doesn't perform, that the, yeah. the fans will look to the manager, why he's done it in the past, but he's not doing it at the moment, yeah. and the, the chairman's going to look to you at why he's invested into his player. It will always fall on the, on the manager, um, Jack, and, and that's the unfortunate side of the game, but the bottom line is the manager then, you know, to, to make sure he stays in, in work, he has to identify these little problems that can manifest into a bigger problem. A manager is always judged and will always be judged on his recruitment. And, uh, and that recruitment is not just the player, that, that recruitment is the backroom staff and the, and the, the whole football club, you know, it, 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 the, the football staff should encompass that, that belief of the manager and make sure that his beliefs actually get through to the field of play. You mentioned uh, Jimmy Billard as well, he, 
picked up an injury on his debut, didn't he, for Hull after uh, the, the, the fee came in. He was a massive signing. He done brilliantly with Wigan um, as well. Uh, surely he, he must have taken that quite badly. It's probably one of the main reasons why I, I, I left Hull City. When you think about it, five million pound investment, which was their biggest transfer fee, and my biggest transfer fee, the, the, the most amount of money that I ever ever spent as a manager. Uh, but then, 32 minutes into the first game, he gets a horrendous injury and he's out for 18 months. Um, but after that 18 months, I was still hoping and praying that, that this player would be the player that he was, or that we knew we had signed. Uh, but unfortunately, he then picked up another injury and the rest is history. But um, yeah, you know, to, to help Jimmy settle in the area, and that's a, a London boy coming up to Hull. That's a City boy going into the sticks. There's a big difference, you know. So. Again, you know, my experiences at Bolton Wanderers helped me to to understand that Jimmy needed to settle as well. How did he take that? How how did the club actually help him? Because it was sort of around that time, if I'm right, that Jimmy was on sort of the the, the fringes of the England squad, and he was going to be maybe the next guy coming through. How did he take that and actually deal with it? He really suffered, Jimmy. Um, he suffered on on and off the field of play because all all Jimmy is and all Jimmy was was a little boy uh, playing football. And somebody pays five million pounds for that. That's that's not his problem. He was a little boy playing football, and that's the reason why he was going to play for England and knocking at the door of England at the time. And um, so when somebody says to you, that little boy, you're not playing football because you're injured, and you can't play football because you're injured, that has a psychological downside. And uh, to have to manage that was was probably one of my, my hardest jobs. Most footballers say when they suffer these injuries, it's one of the loneliest times of their career when they're that they're building themselves back up, and maybe when if some players don't have an agent there to talk to, surely you need another service to come in and actually support the player through those days where yeah. they're not at the football club, or if they are, they're in the gym by themselves, or, or maybe it's just them and a coach for a number of months, and that, that loneliness and that isolation is going to get to the player. We try to identify that, uh, <clears throat> first and foremost, as a backroom staff, by rotating the coaches. You know, regardless of whether that was your strength going into the into the gym, strength and conditioning, or or the fitness levels of, in, inside, we sometimes put a football coach in there, or a physio, or a manager. I did it myself, and to make sure that Jimmy was psychologically, you know, he was still motivated. Um, but the club captain played a massive part. Ian Ashby um, himself, himself and Jimmy formed a very very close relationship off the field of play, and um, and Ian Ashby used to look after him. Um, when his family was down in London and, and they weren't up, and, and Jimmy was 24/7 uh, at the training ground, almost, you know, just trying desperately to get himself fit. Uh, you need motivation, and you need motivation from the same level as you. You know, not, not, I'm not for one minute saying that we're above Jimmy, but by definition, you're a manager, and you, or you're the management staff, uh, and, and Jimmy needed that that uh, that buzz from the player. And uh, Ian Ashby was in the gym majority of the times because he was going through it as well. But it. It's all about your affordability to be able to recruit bigger and better staff and, and identify them areas which you need to help players. And uh, when we were at Bolton Wanderers, we went from a backroom staff of maybe five or six to 35 or 36, and that's to cover all the bases. I mean, we had two player liaison officers, but when you're at Hull City, Hull City's budget was totally different because we were 104 years never in the top flight, and then all of a sudden thrust into the top flight. You then identify areas where you need to improve from a financial perspective, then you plough more money into that area as opposed to that area, thinking that this might, might only be a one-year stop, uh, and then you get relegated and you're back into the championship and you don't need that player liaison office, you know, that type of thing. But um, when we survived the second year, then the player liaison officer was brought in and, and you know, you, it's all about being able to afford it and identifying, you know, your criteria, where you think that money should be, should be allotted. And, and the whole city had two years in the Premier League, and you know that was a time where you're going to get a lot of finances coming from the Premier League himself and from Sky, and and you can afford, you maybe afford to to spend a little bit more, more money in that area. Someone else who's gone through Bolton is uh, Ricardo Vanste. Um, looking at his statistics, when he he's someone who played with Nanny uh, from a young age, mm. came over to the country. I think that the most amazing statistic is he's been here for eight or, or ten years and in this season he scored probably four times the amount yeah. of goals which he has in all those years. Yeah. Why, is, why is it taking that long for him to actually um, produce? We can always say uh, you know, it can just be about settling but it's, at the same time it's the, uh, the emotional, emotional intelligence of the player is important. Um, 
the psychology of the player is important. You know, so he came from from uh, Portugal, small small town in Portugal. I met all his family. So did so did Sam. We had a pre-season tour and. Uh, we played Sporting Lisbon, uh, Guimarães. There was about three or four clubs we played, and I met Ricardo Vaz, Vaz to his family, and he was a big family man. But um, I think from an early, an early age, I think he lost the the male side of that family figurehead, you know. And, and Ricardo became sort of the breadwinner, as it were. Um, and consequently, there was a lot going on off the field of play where, where Ricardo was concerned. And consequently, he couldn't concentrate as much as he wanted to on his football. And then the club turned their back on him, and then he moved to a different club, and he moved to a different club, and he's been knocked around from pillar to post. But the one thing I'd say about Ricardo Vazte is he had a strong belief in his ability. He had a strong belief in his own ability. And um, it's no surprise to me that he's, he's scoring goals at the level that he's scoring goals and probably will have a good season in the Premier League next year. I hope he will anyway, uh, depending on how the playoffs go. But um, when, you, when you describe him as six, seven, eight years being kicked around from pillar to post, and now all of a sudden he's back uh, at the level where he should be and enjoying his football. You can see he's playing with a smile on his face and you can hear the fans there relating to him as well. Because when, when a player plays with a smile on his face, the first thing that it impinges on it affects the fans and they then support with a smile on their face. And um, for Ricardo to score what four, four amount of times the goals that he scored in the previous six or seven years, that just shows you how important what you're talking about is. Then surely someone like uh, Elite Welfare Management, that's where we would come in um, and actually help a player. If you've got uh, somebody there who speaks his own language, yeah. if he speaks Portuguese, you've got someone who can come in there um, you know, it's always going to be a culture shock for someone like him who's grown up in his own country, who moves here from a very young age. Um, so you, you do need someone who he can talk to if, if he's not bringing a wife over here or, or a member of his family. Um, very much so, very much so. There's no doubt in my mind that um, what we're talking about is, is making reference to a player settling quicker and consequently as a, as a football manager, that's music to my ears. That, that means you're going to get the benefit of what you've spent. You may have already spent two or three million scouting this player, and you spent two or three million bring, bringing this player in, and he doesn't settle, and you're losing that kind of money. It's it's an absolute certainty that um, you know um, the product itself um, will be able to help a, a manager first and foremost, as well as the player. How would you manage a player, or what would you say to them if they're a UK-based player who's played in the Premier League for all of their life, or at least played in England for all of their life? But they're not producing on the pitch. How would you sort of maintain their confidence? Maintain that they're doing the right things off the pitch to, to actually help themselves. It is difficult, but um, it is a big, big percentage of, of them as a, a as an individual. If you know, you've got to, the only way to manage it is to give great examples, and there are some some fantastic examples out there of, of players who, you know, a number of on a number of occasions, the amount of people I've talked to, you, they only see you for 90 minutes a week. You know, all the supporters, all the, uh, the punters, uh, the, the TV cameras, the TV crews, the, the people out in the, in the stands. They only see you for 90 minutes a week and then all that Monday to Friday goes into that 90 minutes of, of football. Uh, so that is, that is important, that is key to, to the success of that player from a, from, a, from a career perspective more than a psychology perspective. But, um, you know, you, you, all you can do is educate or try to educate them off the field of play and then hope they, they'll produce it when they cross the white line. A prime example of that was, of course, uh, Dean Windass, who, when he retired from the game, everyone thought he was going to hang up his boots, enjoy his retirement with uh, a, a Premier League win, a championship winner's medal, yeah. playoff winning. Um, he also scored the winning goal to get you up there. Um, but it wasn't as simple as that. It's, for a lot of people like him, it's impossible for them to replace that euphoria of scoring a goal on a Saturday afternoon and doing the job which they've been trained in for the yeah. best part of 20, 30 years. Do, do you think clubs do enough to offer post-retirement career planning Maybe as well not. as support? Maybe not, because once a club, once a player's left a club, I think that's more, more or less the ties are severed and, and that's the harsh reality of football, unfortunately. Uh, but where supporters are concerned, they still have an affinity to that player. I've just, uh, I've just missed a call from Dean Windus. Um, and the reason being, um, every so often, just go and sit and talk to him, have a coffee, maybe play nine holes or 18 holes of golf. He just needs, well, Dean, for instance, just needs to know that there's people out there that still care. Um, I'm fortunate with regards to um, my own life that once football turns its back on you, it appears to, 
because you're out of work by definition. Um, I think uh, your family become important, your friends become important, but your former colleagues are, are vital to that support mechanism. And uh, I think Dean just felt a little bit lonely when he when he went through that awful decision making process to do what he and what he did. And consequently, since that, yes, myself, and again, I'm talking about Ian Ashby, um, a character as a club captain, strong character, strong personality, but understood people as well, and, and that in emotional intelligence that I'm talking about. You recognise these situations and you try to alleviate them or arrest the situation by just sitting and talking to people. Well, his friends, his family, his colleagues are shocked by the news that he tried to commit suicide as, as we were. Yeah, very much so. The, the, I think the world of football was shocked and, uh, and horrid um, because you feel, you feel responsible. Well, I did. Um, consequently, the reason why um, I contacted Dean, I felt guilty that I hadn't been in touch with him. Um, having given him the opportunity to have that euphoria that he, he gave me to my career, you know, so it's, for me it's a two-way street. It's, it's that bit more shocking that nobody, even his closest friends, couldn't even spot the signs there. And it's not just in, there's so many players over the past year who are suffering from depression, but they, they continually seem to pass by without people noticing it. Well, you know, you, just you can always... That taboo still attached with it. You can always talk to people, but you don't know actually what's going on between the ears. You can see the eyes, you can see the body language, you can understand or try to understand what these guys are feeling, but um, there's only they actually know, and the only way to get it out of them is, to talk, is, is by talking. Do you feel things like this, when, when people bottle up their emotions, is that down to them personally, or is it something which you can actually control if you educate kids from a young age? And, and actually teach them that it's okay to, to be like this, yeah. whatever your preference, it's fine. If you have got people to talk to there, obviously that's where EWM would come in. Um, is something like that needed, an education from a young level like grassroots as well? Absolutely, for sure. And you, you, since we've been talking, uh, the more I've been thinking about this, the more important it is. And yet, I've been in the game of football for 35, 40 years and, and not realised how important it is. Yeah, just to sit down and talk, to educate, to educate from a younger age, to educate from an older age, to educate whilst you're in amongst it. Um, it's, so, it's so easy for a footballer to just say, well, get me out on the field to play and forget about the rest of the world. But there's a lot more to it than that, you know. There's what, what's going, going on in that game of football, there's what's going on out in the outside world, in your family, in your friends. And it, it's just vaguely important that um, people do open, uh, lift these barriers um, these restrictions that, that players are playing on them.